Well, I'm glad to know I can believe God this morning. Amen. Amen. I don't care what the world may say. I will serve him still because I've seen what he can do. Amen. Amen. Oh, some of y'all are going to have to wake up this morning. <laughs> All right. Turn with me to Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5. We're going to start something brand new this morning. I originally had intended for this to be this morning and tonight, but as I've dug into it deeper, it's going to take a little longer to get everything out, so we're going to stretch this out over a few weeks. We're going to talk about this morning, life in the Spirit, life in the Spirit, Galatians chapter 5. At the age of seven, my father called me to his office. I was pastoring a little church in South Mississippi. Basically said something to the effect of, don't you think it's about time that you, you did what you're supposed to do? And I didn't really know what he was talking about. But I knew I loved my father and I wanted to please him. So whatever it was he wanted out of me, that's what I was going to do. And so he suggested that I pray a little sinner's prayer, and, and I did. I was baptized because I knew that would make him happy. I didn't understand what sin was, nor did I understand that I needed a Savior. I knew this was something everyone did and should do. It was something I knew my parents wanted me to do, so therefore that's, that's what I did. As the years went by, I did not have a developing appetite for the things of God. I didn't desire to read his word. I, I was usually more excited when church was over. I, I did not want to be there to start with and couldn't wait for it to be done. My goal in life was simply to stay out of trouble. I didn't like trouble. I didn't like to get in trouble. I didn't like for anybody to be mad at me. I just want to stay out of trouble. My dad had a leather belt, was about that wide. And he never played golf that I know of, but he had a pretty good swing, I can tell you that. <laughs> in my early teen years, being raised in a Christian home, I had a clear understanding by this point of what sin was. I had such a clear understanding, had a good conscience, that I soon realized that I was always sinning. It wasn't long before the Holy Spirit of God began to convict me and I came under the weight of the sin and I would tell myself, I'm going to stop. I got to stop these things. I know I can't act like this. I can't think like this. It's wrong. It's sin. I'm going to stop. But the problem was I couldn't. I wanted to. My conscience told me what I was doing was wrong, but I had no power to overcome sin. Guilt piled upon guilt. And the conviction of the Holy Spirit grew stronger in my life. I finally reached a point to ask the question, what's wrong with me? Something is wrong with me. It's usually the first step of God really bringing you to where he wants you to be. It's when you finally come to a point of, hey, there's something wrong. I can't deny it. I can't push it to the side. There's something wrong with me. The conclusion was very simple. The Holy Spirit was telling me I was lost. The only thing I had was religion. And things that I, I thought were, I did were pretty good, but the Spirit of God convicted me and to the point that one Sunday night after church, in my pastor's office, I knelt down on his couch, repented of my sin and trusted Jesus and asked him to save me and forgive me and cleanse me. And I can tell you that night in September of 1987, my life was changed. I was set free Amen. in Jesus. It was moments, I mean seconds after I asked the Lord to save me that a sweet peace came upon my heart and my life. I felt clean and pure before God. I felt set free from my sin and myself. I was free. Every now and then I go back and remember just how free I am. I go back and remember that night when Jesus set me free. It was just the other morning I was in my prayer time and I just started thanking God for setting me free. 
And I got so overcome in realizing I am just as free today as I was almost 25 years ago. I am just as free this very moment because of who Jesus is, who what the blood of the cross did for me. I am still free today. And the Bible says whom the Son sets free, he is free indeed. Amen. But there have been times in the almost 25 years that I've been walking with Jesus that others have tried to steal my freedom in Christ by putting me under a load or a set of rules that I had to obey if I wanted to continue walking with Christ. I'll give you an example. Since I was a senior in high school, one of my friends was very critical of me. He thought I was very unspiritual because I didn't wear a belt. <laughs> now, I wear a belt today, but it is not to prove to you how spiritual I am. It keeps me from being embarrassed. <laughs> but that was one of the rules of his household, and that, therefore, it should be one of his rules and it should be one of my rules. Godly people wear belts. I wanted a verse in Scripture for that, but... Couldn't find one, but you know what happened? Because I was sensitive, I was young in the Lord, and I, I wanted to be right with God, I came under this weight of guilt because I didn't wear a belt. He wasn't pulling me aside in love and saying, hey, I heard you say something yesterday, and I just, I just want you to know that I think that is not a good testimony for a Christian. No, that's not what happened. I didn't wear a belt. Even since then, there have been moments in, in our married life where people have tried to steal our joy and put us under a set of rules that if you are going to be right with God, this is what you're supposed to do. Now, I may get a little personal, and if I hit you, I'm sorry. No, I'm not. I'm just going to tell you what happened to me. <laughs> and if I offend you with what I'm about to say, then, then I'll, I'll be at the back of the church in a little while, and you can apologize to me. Make sure you're right with the, with the Lord. But there was a time in our young married life when people put Sandra and I under a weight of guilt and a load because we only had two children. And she told us that it was our job to have more and more. Matter of fact, one lady told us at one point that, that the Bible says be fruitful and multiply. You didn't multiply. All you did was add. <laughs> and I said, no, ma'am. There were two, now there are four. Two times two is four. I didn't do great in math, but I got that one. Matter of fact, she told me one day, she said, oh, don't you realize that John Wesley was the 11th of 12 children or something to that effect? And I said, well, you need to understand that in this family, there will be no John Wesley. But did you understand that Jesus was the firstborn? John the Baptist was the one and only. <laughs> Isaac was the first. I mean, come on. But the thing of it is, it wasn't so much of whether or not we should have children. It was this guilt, this load of guilt that if you want to be right with God, there are these external things that you have to do. If you want, to, if you want God's love, there are some external things you have to do. You see, I have found that it's easier to conform to a man-made list of rules than it is to have a relationship with Jesus. It is easier for me to have a sheet of paper and say, okay, today I've got to do this and I've got to do that and I've got to do this so that God will be happy with me. If God, wasn't, if God was happy with me before I got saved, why is he not happy now? He loved me before I came to him. He died for me. The Bible says that in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He loved me before he saved me. So why is it that now that I have given him my life that his love has become conditional? Now, I understand fellowship is conditional. And I, I'm not going to say that what I'm preaching to you gives you the right to live any old way you want to. You just hang on. I'm going to get there. 
But what we have seen in our society is that some people will come to know Christ. They, they just get saved. They're brand new in the Lord. They don't know anything about the Bible. They don't know anything about Jesus. All they know is that they were lost and now they're found. All they know is they were un, ungodly, wrong, and lost, and now they're saved and they're forgiven and cleansed. And then somebody who's been religious for a long time comes up and says to them, hey, you know what? We're so glad you got saved. But now that you're saved, you're going to have to do this and you're going to do that because if you don't, boy, God will knock you down. So you got to be careful. Every day you gotta, you're going to do this, you got to do that because if you don't, God's going to be mad at you. And so what happens then is they start the same cycle, in my opinion, as those who are giving, him, giving them these instructions of religious exercises that do not come out of a heart of love for God, but out of a fear that if I don't do these certain things, God won't accept me anymore. Has anybody ever, ever known uh, or lived that kind of relationship where it was all out of fear that, well, if I don't do this, they're going to be mad at me. If I don't do this, they're going to be upset. What kind of relationship is that? This, this type of mentality was going on among the Galatians. And Paul has written this letter to the Galatians to deal with some of these issues that have come up. On Paul's first missionary journey, he traveled to the southern part of Asia Minor and established churches among those known as the Galatians. The churches listed as in Acts 13, uh, chapters 13 and 14 are Antioch, Iconium, Lystra, and Derbe. Paul preached the gospel. People were saved and the church was born. And after Paul returned from his trip, he received word that false teachers had come in among the church. We call them now the Judaizers. And what they did is they came into these places in Galatia and they said, hey, uh, number one, we're not so sure about Paul. Now, he may or may not be an apostle. Uh, but anyway, we, we know he taught you about Jesus, the Messiah, and he is the Messiah. And we, we're so glad that you believe in Jesus. But now that you have uh, believed in Jesus, there's some things you're going to have to do. And number one, you're going to be circumcised. All right, because what Jesus would tell you if he were here today is that you need to follow the law of Moses. You need to do everything in the law of Moses. You're going to be circumcised. You're going to follow all these rules. And uh, really what we're saying is uh, that to be saved, to be fully saved, you're going to need to, to follow the law and be a Jew. Convert to Judaism. That's what you're going to need to do. And Paul hears about this and he writes to them because he is concerned that they're, they're going down the wrong path. Because I want to remind you, salvation is Jesus plus nothing. By grace have you been saved through faith. It's a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. So Paul urgently writes them, and I want to give you, for just a moment, I want to give you an overview of, of the, the first five chapters of Galatians, and then I want to get into the meat of what I want to share with you this morning. First of all, in chapter 1, Paul hits the ground running with the gospel. He said, Paul, an apostle, not from men nor through man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead. Verse 3, grace to you and peace from God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from this present evil age, according to the will of God and Father. He hits the ground running saying, this is the Jesus that I preach to you who gave himself for your sins. Now notice that in verse six, he starts writing in on the problem. He said, I marvel uh, that, I'm sorry, I marvel that you are turning away so soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel. He said, I can't figure it out. I preach the gospel. You, you were saved. You experienced the joy of the Lord. You know what it's like to be set free. And now suddenly I'm, I'm just marveling that you have turned to go toward another gospel so quickly. Come to believe something else so soon. Notice that there are no words of encouragement to start this letter off. Even the Corinthian church. And if you've studied the uh, first and second Corinthians, you know the kind of problems that Paul was writing to deal with. But even in the Corinthian church, he started by saying, I thank my God for you, giving them some encouragement, uh, some, some uh, word of encouragement. But no, not the Galatians. He just jumps right in going, I can't believe it. I'm marveling that you have so quickly turned away. 
And then he spends the rest of chapter 1 and, and chapter 2 defending his apostolic standing. Now in chapter 2, in portions of chapter 2, he defends the gospel and its power over the law. Verse 16 says, knowing that a man, chapter 2 verse 16, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Christ Jesus that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law. For the works of the law, no flesh shall be justified. Reminding us that the power of the gospel won over the, over the law. Chapter 3, he reminds us that we are justified, as even as I read there, justified by Christ, uh, faith in Christ alone. In chapter 3, verse 2, he said, this only I want to learn from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Which was it that led you to salvation? Was it the law? Which was it that gave you the, the power of the Holy Spirit? Was it the law? Or was it faith, believing in the gospel message? Verse 3, are you so foolish, having begun in the Spirit, are you now being made perfect through the flesh? What did you do to get saved? I trusted Jesus. That's all I did. I trusted Jesus. What do you do now? Well, I'm working at it. I'm working at it. One of the, one of the age old phrases is I'm just doing the best I can. Anybody ever heard it? I'm just doing the best I can. Anybody ever said it? Just doing the best I can. He never called us to do the best we could. He called us to surrender to the Lord and let him do through us what only he can do. My best is still a failure. It's still a failure. The only way we can live the Christian life is through the power of the Holy Spirit. One of the, I, I don't know if I've told you this or not, but one of the songs my dad hated growing up. You know, my parents were big Southern gospel fans and, and uh, my dad used to drive a truck when he wasn't preaching and, and that's how he made a living when he wasn't in meetings. And so we'd go down, I'd go with him all summer long. We'd go down the road listening to Southern gospel music. I mean, that was the first time I ever heard Midnight Cry was in the cab of that truck. But there was one song that every time it come on, he'd find country, he'd find something else. It didn't matter what he could get a hold of. He was leaving. And that was, I'm coming up the rough side of the mountain, just doing the best I can. Coming up the rough side, poor old me, I'm just suffering so for Jesus, doing the best I can. When that's not what the Bible says, the Bible says that we are more than conquerors through Christ Jesus. So Paul reminds them that we're justified by faith in Christ alone. He reminds us that we are preserved by a promise in chapter 4 and, and verse 28. He said, now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are children of the promise. He said, even before there was law, even before the law, you're going back to the law. Why don't you go back past the law when God promised Abraham that I will bless your descendants. They will become like the sands of the sea and all the nations will be blessed by you. It was even there a promise that the Gentiles would come to know Jesus to the seed of Abraham. We were the promise. We were preserved by a promise. And then chapter 5, verse 1, he said, Stand therefore, stand fast therefore in the liberty by which Christ has made us free. I like what the, how the NIV translates that. It says it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. He set us free to be free. It is for freedom that he set us free. And he said, do not be entangled again with a yoke of bondage. He released you. He set you free. Don't put something back on that ties you down, makes you a slave again. You've been set free. Verse 13 of chapter 5, he said, for you, brethren, have been called to liberty. Only do not use liberty as an opportunity for the flesh. But through love, serve one another. For all the law is fulfilled in one word. Even in this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. We have been given liberty. He said, but this is not an opportunity for you to go and live according to your flesh. We're here to serve each other. Serve the Lord 
and serve each other. Now, having said all that, understanding where he's brought us from, understanding what he has had to say about the law, look at verse 16. I say then, because of all that, walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of your flesh. For the flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh and these are contrary to one another so that you do not do the things that you wish. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envies, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. And those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live in the Spirit, let us walk in the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. I want to talk to you over the next several weeks on the subject of life in the Spirit. Life in the Spirit. There are four things that we're going to address from chapters 5 verse 16 through verse 26. Today we're going to talk about the walk. Walk in the Spirit. And tonight I'm going to finish that. I thought I was going to get to move on, but I learned from the 8 o'clock service that I'm going to finish uh, the walk. The next week we're going to look at the war. And then as the Lord leads following that, we're going to look at the work. And finally, the witness of the Spirit. Life in the Spirit. The night that I was saved, the night that I surrendered my life to Christ, the night I put my faith and trust in Jesus, I became a child of the King. The Bible says that he came to live inside of me, and Paul said it very clearly in Galatians chapter 3, verse 26, for you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. Chapter 4, verse 7, he said, therefore, you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. I want to tell you something, church, there have been times in my life and even recently when I forget my position in Christ Jesus, when I live beneath who God has saved me to be. I remember my old self. I even sometimes live according to my old self. But there's a new nature that's been uh, given to me. It is God himself come to live inside of me. And now I'm not just an old uh, wretched beggar. I'm a child of the king. My name has been written in the Lamb's book of life. His royal blood flows through my veins. Not because of how good I am, but because of what Jesus did. I stand before you today not claiming to be anything or anybody. I stand today on the redemption of the Lord Jesus. It's the only basis I have to claim today. I've been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Amen. Washed white. Made a child of God. That is my position in Christ. Matter of fact, the Bible teaches us that, that if you know Jesus, we've already been seated in heavenly places. We are his children. We're heirs of God. Joint heirs with the Lord Jesus Christ. Through Christ, I have been proclaimed righteous. Praise the Lord when God looks down at me, when the Father looks at me, he doesn't see who I was. He don't see even who I could be or what I am. He sees his son, Jesus who washed me white as snow. It's the redemption of Jesus that I stand today. It is the Spirit, I'm sorry, it is the Lord Jesus who justifies me. He is the one who placed me in that position. He is the one that declared me righteous because he is righteous and I've trusted in him. But it is the Spirit of God that sanctifies me. It is the Son of God who justifies me. It is the Spirit of God that sanctifies me. 
Sanctification is the process of the life of Jesus Christ lived out of me. When I got saved, I received all of who God is. Sanctification is a process of the rest of my life of God getting all of who I am. Forming his life in me. Creating himself in me. Teaching me, helping me. Molding me and making me. He is the potter. I am the clay. He is molding me to be like Jesus. Forming the very life of Christ in me. You see, a believer can no more sanctify himself than he could save himself in the first place. I can't sanctify myself. I could say to myself today, you know what? I'm going to be holy. But you know what? The only person who can make me holy is the Holy Spirit. He is the one who is forming the life of Christ. It is his job in me to work in me the life of Christ. I want to tell you, folks, I'm so glad today that what you see is not a finished product. I'm so glad today that what you see is a work in progress. He's still working on me. He's still molding me. He's still making me to what he'd have me to be. It is the Holy Spirit's job to sanctify me, to set me apart, to mold me and make me. Problems arise when people try to heap rules and regulations on new believers to make them look like their perception of Christ. You see, that's what really happens. When somebody has in their mind, this is what a godly person should look like. It may or may not be based on biblical principle, but they start heaping upon you guilt and rules and say, you ought to live. If you, you say you're saved, you ought to be doing this. You ought to be going here. You ought to be living like this. Matter of fact, what tends to happen is people will come up and say, especially to a new believer or even to anybody, they feel like they can push their way. It's like, you know what? Are you reading your Bible? Are you praying? Are you witnessing for people? Are you you doing all the things you're supposed to do? Because if you're not, boy, God's going to tear you up. So what happens is we respond in fear. And every morning we get up, read the Bible, going, I got to read the Bible because, man, if I don't, God's going to be mad at me. He's going to be angry with me. And I got to pray because, you know, the Bible says to pray. And if I don't pray, God's going to be upset with me. And, boy, I got to witness. And you know what? Then we push it one step further. Well, how, how long did you pray? How long did you pray? Well, I don't know. I, I did, you know, I do that sometimes. I finish my prayer time. I look at the clock and see how long it took. It's a program. We've been programmed to think, well, the longer you pray, the more spiritual you are. Well, Jesus made it very clear that the Pharisees prayed for hours on end, and they no more knew God than a wall. How many chapters of the Bible? Well, you, that ain't enough to read the Bible. You can't read that much of the Bible and be right with God. How many people did you witness to this week? Only five? Is that all? You've got to do better than that. You've got to do better than that. I'll tell you what happens. I have been guilty. Now, I'm disciplined. I get up every morning about the same time and get in my office and get before the Lord. But what happens is if I'm not paying attention, is it becomes something that I must do. Well, I'm a pastor now. A pastor has to read his Bible. I got to preach Sunday. I mean, did y'all realize Sunday comes every week? Every week, and I got to be ready, so I got to read the Bible so I can have something to say. I can have some kind of word to give. I got to pray because, I mean, how how can I tell our church people to pray when I'm not spending, uh, and I read books and they say that these people spent hours in prayer and I want to so bad. And then I fail and go, man, God, and then I come to church and God blesses and moves Because you see what happens in the end is I just come to God and say, God, I'm a broken person. I can't seem to do it right. But all I know is if you don't touch me, if you don't help me, if you don't speak through me, what I got to say is empty anyway. Because you know what God really wants? For me to get into his word and say, God, I need you to talk to me. I need you to speak to me. Lord, I need a fresh touch this morning. I need your word to jump off those pages and hit me in the heart and change who I am today. 
I get on my face before God, not because if I don't, then God's going to beat me up. I get on my face because he's my friend. He's my savior. He's my redeemer. He's my brother. He is the shelter in which I run. He is the refuge in which I hide. He is my counselor, almighty God, the king of kings. And he said, I can come boldly into his throne of grace and find mercy in my help, my time of need. I can find help when I need him. So it's a privilege to come into his presence like, God, I need you. I need thee all. I need thee every hour. I need thee. How can I not live for him with all he has done for me? How can I not, when somebody says something to me or if God pricks my heart and say, hey, you need to speak to that person, how can I not tell them about the love of the Lord Jesus with all he's done for me? Not because he's going to beat me up, but because I love him and I love them and I want them to know what God can do for them because of what he's done for me. Oh, it's easy to get a list of rules and, and, and feel justified at the end of the day because you can check every one of them off. I read my Bible, gave my tithe, I went to church this week, I told three people about Jesus. I must be right with God. Then my question is, what has God said to you today? When you read your Bible, what did he say to you? What did the Spirit of God burn in you today? When you spent time in prayer, what was God saying to you? The Bible says, or Jesus himself said that when the Holy Spirit comes, he will convict the world of sin, of judgment of righteousness. And what he does for lost people, he does for saved people. The Holy Spirit is my convictor. I don't know if that's a word, but it, it's what I mean. He is the one who convicts me. He's the one who lives inside of me, creating the life of Christ to come out of me. You see, God has not called me to perform for him. He has called me to allow him to perform his work through me. And there's a difference. I can be busy about church work. I can be busy about spiritual things and feel good at the end of the day. But did God work through, through me or did I go do some stuff for God? It is easy for us to, to have a list of rules and a list of regulations to apply to other people so we can judge and say, hey, did, did they, do you line up? Oh, you're not. No, you're not cutting it. If you get to go to heaven, it's going to be something. Do you know it is the, the Holy Spirit's job to make me what I should be? It's the Holy Spirit's job to give me the convictions I need to have. It is the Holy Spirit's job. I'm not under the law. He's made that clear. The law has set me free. Matter of fact, let me just show that to you. Uh, in Galatians chapter 3, verses 19 through 23, he he, he's asking the question, what is the purpose of the law then? What purpose does the law serve? And in verse 24, he answers it. Therefore, the law was our tutor to bring us to Christ that we might be justified by faith. It was the law working in my heart through the conviction of the Holy Spirit that brought me to the end of myself. And I said, I am wicked. I am lost. There's nothing good. You see, there was a time I thought I was pretty good. Matter of fact, during those days, I thought I was better than all of my peers. But what happened on the night that I got saved when I reached the end of myself and realized I'm the chief of sinners. I'm the worst one here. I've been playing games all these years. I'm lost and undone. The law was my tutor. It guided me to the, but you see, that's as far as it can go. All it can do is say to you how bad you are. There, beyond that, it has no power. Nowhere in the law is it going to show you how to have all those sins forgiven. It's going to keep telling you to work harder and do better. Work harder, do better. Work harder, do better. And sadly enough, that is what we have made out of church. Work harder, do better. Work harder, do better. But what he says there, look at the next verse. He says there, but after faith has come, we're no longer under a tutor. When I got saved, the law became powerless to me. Why? Because I didn't need the law to tell me what God wanted. I have God inside of me telling me what he wants. 
The Spirit of God came to reside in me. He couldn't do anything with my old nature. He couldn't redeem my old nature. That's what he said, walk in the Spirit, you'll not fulfill the lust of the flesh. That's my flesh, that's my old nature. It's unredeemable. God had to give me something brand new. He had to put something inside of me. I was an old, crea or old creature. Now I'm a new creation in Christ. Old things passed away. All things have become new. Because God couldn't do anything with my old nature. My old nature still exists. The old man is still there. God put into me a new man. And I don't need the law hovering over me, beating me up on what I should or should not be doing. What I need is to turn to the Spirit of God and say, Lord, what do you want me to do? I'm telling you, as I have walked with God these 25 years, it has been a growing, learning experience, but I've reached a point in my life when I have come to do something, the Spirit of God says, no, 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 back away. It's not for you. Not for you. Others may, but you cannot. Not for you. There are times I have spoken a word out of my mouth and the Spirit of God said, oh no, that was wrong. You need to get right with God over that and repent over that. You see, I didn't need the law hovering over me. I had God inside of me, teaching me, training me, molding me and making me. When we walk in the Spirit, it is the Holy Spirit who is guiding us. It is the Holy Spirit who is convicting us. I'm reading right now a book by Jim Cimbala, who is a pastor of Brooklyn Tabernacle. It's called Spirit Rising, and it's all about the Spirit's work in our life. And he tells a story of a young woman who was world-renowned in the modeling industry. She came to church and gave her life to Christ, gloriously saved one Sunday morning. She didn't know anything about religion. She didn't know anything about church. I'm going to tell you, that's some of the best people you can get a hold of right there. I could go on. I, I'm going I'm to tell the story. <laughs> she got up Monday morning and went to work. As you can imagine, in the modeling profession, there are times where the things you have to wear and the poses they're asking of you could cause someone who is walking with Jesus to feel a little uncomfortable. And she noticed after the first week or so, boy, she was not happy. This was not fulfilling to her anymore. She was uncomfortable doing the things that she was doing. And so she went to her boss after, the, I think, of the second week and said, listen, I, I, I would like for you to change my venues. I don't want to do some of these. I'm uncomfortable posing in some of the outfits they're asking me to pose in. Nobody pulled her aside and said, hey, now that you're saved, you got to quit that modeling stuff. You, you can't be going around half naked like that. Matter of fact, if you, if you really saved and you give that up today, it's amazing that the Holy Spirit can tell us what we need to know. As a matter of fact, as of this day, she has completely retired from the modeling industry. Because the Spirit of God kept working in her, saying to her, this is not right. you got to move away from that. But you see, we can't wait that long. We who are self-righteous and think we have the, our spiritual lives by the tail, and we can look at everybody else and say, well, see, now, now you need to change what you're doing right there. Instead of going into our prayer closet and say, Father, I pray the Spirit of God, touch this person, help them, grow them, mold them and make them into the image of Christ. We want to help them. I don't know, uh, I, I'm sure you saw our bass player, Thomas Luksha. He and his wife this past week just had a brand new baby. And I got to go to the hospital and my wife held that sweet little child and you know, while we were, we were in the room, oh, 30 minutes or so, I guess, and now, you, you know, we didn't say to the baby, Sandra was holding Sophia, we didn't say to the baby, now, you know, it's so wonderful that you're in the world. I mean, your mama carried you almost nine months or a little over nine months, and, and it's so wonderful you've come in the world. We prayed for you. As a matter of fact, I can remember uh, last year we got before the Lord, 
because she was afraid of a miscarriage, that some things have happened in, their, uh, in her family's life, and she was afraid of that. And, and we pray, we join hands, we ask God to bring this child safely into the world. And, and here is this precious baby who is now here and alive. And you know what we didn't do that day? We didn't say, now, now Sophia, you're so sweet. We're so glad you're in this world. We're so glad God brought you safely. Now, now if you're going to grow up and be a good little girl, here's some things you're going to have to do. Now, number one, you're going to act like this. Number two, you have to do that. Now, if you don't do that, uh, you're going to get in a lot of trouble. I'm just telling you that right now. Why? She's just a baby. She will grow and she will learn. Her parents will teach her the lessons that she needs to learn. And what mom and dad miss out, life will teach lessons as well. Why is it then that we take it upon ourselves to say to new believers and to any Christian for that matter, well, bless God, this is what you're going to do. If you, if you don't do these things, God's going to get you. When we are all, if we've been born again, all have the spirit of God inside of us who is molding us and making us into the image of Christ. We may disagree. We may have problems with each other from time to time. But it all comes down to, you know what, you're, you're God's. And I can tell you what I believe. If I think you're heading in the wrong direction, I can offer you the best godly advice that I know. But in the end, it is the Spirit of God that has to take you where he wants you to be. Churches have become more about manipulation Growth statistics but what I believe personally is the power of the Holy Spirit to mold us and make us into the church he wants us to be Amen. if I had to manipulate you to get you to do something it's not God who is doing it Amen. if I believe that God has led me to do something and I share it with you then I have to believe the Spirit of God can identify and bring you into agreement with what God has said to me Walk in the Spirit. And you shall not fulfill the lust of your flesh. And we're going to finish this tonight, but that word shall not could be better translated cannot. If you walk in the Spirit, you cannot fulfill the lust of the flesh. Because your focus, your heart, and your mind is being obedient to the Holy Spirit. Are you walking in the Spirit? Have you been beat up by a set of rules, living under a, a legalistic set of, of expectations that God has not placed on you? This morning, you can just simply say, Dear God, I surrender myself fresh in you. I want to hear your Holy Spirit speak to my heart. You may be here this morning and you don't know anything about the Spirit because you've never been born of the Spirit. You've never been born again. Today, you can know Him. As I've shared with you my testimony of what God did for me, if he can do it for me, he can do it for you. Let's stand together with every head bowed and every eye closed.